Well, good morning. Thanks so much for tuning in. This is obviously a uh, unique situation for all of us. We decided on Saturday afternoon that it would be good for us to to not meet together as as a congregation, and uh, so that is why we are in this situation now. Uh, my heart aches to be with all of you. I truly believe that there would be nothing that uh, would lift my spirits more than singing with all of you and uh, singing the Lord's praises, hearing from his word and, and seeing all of you and encouraging one another. I thought that it would be uh, appropriate for us to at least have some time in God's word together. So what I'm going to do is fairly simple. I'll offer a prayer where uh, I pray for God's blessing upon what we do and uh, praying for some of the people in our church who have needs right now. And then lifting up uh, prayers for our communities and uh, those we know and, and those uh, parts of the world that are particularly being uh, challenged by this uh, coronavirus outbreak. Uh, we need to stay in prayer and to truly give it all to the Lord. Um, it's been shown over the past several days that there is great wisdom in, in practicing social distancing and that uh, fueled a lot of the, uh, the conversation around uh, canceling today. And uh, so as we do so, we know that there may be challenges that we face and um, we may need to do things that are certainly out of the ordinary. But we know that the Lord is in control. He is reigning. He is ruling. He is on the throne. Earlier this week, when this situation started to unfold, I just I felt that it was abundantly necessary to, to address it from the pulpit. And so I, I wrote a sermon uh, that I was hoping to, to give in the presence of you all um, that reflects on John chapter 16 and, and this current situation with the coronavirus outbreak. Uh, but I wanted to give it to you nonetheless, and so uh, let's ask the Lord's blessing as we look to his word in just a few minutes and, and ask that he would be pleased to, to build us up as his people, uh, even as we do so in a unique way this morning. Let's pray. Heavenly Father and gracious God, we come before you today, and we ask that you would be pleased uh, to have your love and your grace shed upon us. We confess that even though this is um, uncharted territory for many of us, that uh, we need you nonetheless. We need you as much as we ever have. And indeed, in many ways, we feel that we, we need you more now. But we know that in that situation, what you are doing is showing us the need that we've always had for you. So we ask that you would bless us as we look to your word. We ask that you would bless it to us and to our lives. We think of those who have special need and are particularly on our minds and hearts recently. As we have lifted her up so many times in recent months, we lift up Vine Newtbar to you and her continued struggle against her cancer. Pray that you would be with her. We pray for Roger Bonema, who had a successful back surgery this week. And even though he has recovery ahead and is in pain now, we thank you for the care that he's receiving. But we do think of him, and our heart goes out to him and his family. We pray that you would strengthen him and uphold him. We pray that you would be with our brother, Bern de Graff, who had a second operation this week, and we pray that... Uh, that will, will be the, the, the proper solution and that he would uh, recover quickly and that you would strengthen him. We, we thank you that Ben DeYoung had a successful procedure this week and we pray that you would aid and help him in his recovery. We lift up Leona Van Drunen to you who uh, was in the hospital this past week and has been diagnosed with having uh, multiple minor strokes. And so we ask uh, that, that you would be with her. We thank you for the care that she has received, and we pray that she would uh, be able to receive uh, clear answers and, 
and good uh, solutions for treatment going forward. We pray in this time of great confusion and upheaval. We know that you are on the throne and in control. We pray for this world and the nations and parts of this world that are particularly undergoing uh, the stress of this pandemic, places like China and Iran and Italy. We pray for those who are afflicted there, and we pray that you would be with those who are suffering, and if, if you would be so pleased that you would alleviate their suffering and, and do so quickly. We also pray for Reverend Michael Brown, a pastor with Reformation Italy in Milan. We pray for his family and his congregation and his surrounding community and region as this disease spreads and as many die and as hospitals continue to be overrun. Give him strength and comfort to minister to those so affected and keep him and his family safe during this difficult time. So holy and mighty Lord, the one who turned back the plague from the houses of your people, We ask you to hear our cry for those who are suffering and dying under the visitation of disease. Mercifully bless the means which are used to stop the spread of sickness. Strengthen those who labor to heal and comfort the afflicted. Support those who are in pain or distress. Speedily restore those who have been brought low. Grant us all that we would perceive how frail and uncertain our life is so that we may apply our hearts unto the heavenly wisdom which leads to eternal life. And unto all who are beyond healing, grant your heavenly comfort and your saving grace through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. And the passage for our time in the scriptures this morning comes from John 16. John 16, the end of that chapter. It was my intention to remain in the Gospel of John through Easter Sunday and to use the, the accounts of John's Gospel as we think particularly about the life and the work of our Lord Jesus Christ as we move towards, towards Easter Sunday. But these words are particularly helpful as we think through all the things that are going on. And so we read from John chapter 16. We'll begin reading in verse 17, but we'll be focusing on mainly on the last verse of the chapter, chapter 33. So this is John 16. Some of Jesus' disciples said to one another, what does he mean by saying, in a little while you will see me no more, and then after a little while you will see me? And because I am going to the Father, they kept asking, What does he mean by a little while? We don't understand what he is saying. Jesus saw what they wanted to ask him about this, so he said to them, Are you asking one another what I meant when I said, In a little while you will see me no more, and then after a little while you will see me? I tell you the truth, you will weep and mourn while the world rejoices. You will grieve, but your grief will turn to joy. A woman giving birth to a child has pain because her time has come. But when her baby is born, she forgets the anguish because of her joy that a child is born into the world. So with you. Now is your time of grief, but I will see you again and you will rejoice. And no one will take away your joy. In that day you will no longer ask me anything. I tell you the truth, my Father will give you whatever you ask in my name. Until now, you have not asked for anything in my name. Ask and you will receive, and your joy will be complete. Though I have been speaking figuratively, a time is coming when I will no longer use this kind of language, but will tell you plainly about my Father. In that day, you will ask in my name. I am not saying that I will ask the Father on your behalf. No, the Father himself loves you because you have loved me and have believed that I came from God. I came from the Father and entered the world. Now I am leaving the world and going back to the Father. Then Jesus' disciples said, Now you are speaking clearly and without figures of speech. Now we can see that you know all things and that you do not even need to have anyone ask you questions. 
This makes us believe that you came from God. You believe at last, Jesus answered. But a time is coming and has come when you will be scattered, each to his own home. You will leave me all alone, yet I am not alone, for my Father is with me. And then the last verse in today's text as we consider together. I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. Amen. The grass withers and the flower fades. The word of our God endures forever. Amen. In the 1940s, the world lived under a black cloud of terrible expectation. Much of the world was at war, and rumors abounded that there was a bomb, and bombs indeed, that could take out vast areas of land and huge populations. How does one live in such an age? How does one go about daily life when terror, anxiety, and despair encroach upon the human heart? C.S. Lewis wrote a, a brilliant piece titled Living in an Atomic Age, which attempted to answer that very question. Basically, his answer was this. We should be doing sensible and human things. We should be doing sensible and human things. We should be reading bathing children, enjoying time in conversation with friends, and serving our neighbors. He said this, if this bomb does come, may it find us doing these things and not huddled together talking about bombs. They may break our bodies, but they need not dominate our minds. Some of you may be thinking that uh, this particular essay by C.S. Lewis is actually uh, proving the opposite of what we're doing because so many people are uh, finding it wise to go into their own homes and self-quarantine for a while and to socially distance. But I, I think the principles still hold. God has made this world so that we can understand it. He's shown us the many ways over the, the past couple of weeks in which we can uh, attempt to diffuse Uh, the effects of this virus. But the principle still holds that we ought to be found doing sensible and human things. And that comes from a confidence that arises from knowing the God of Scripture, knowing that He is in control of all things, knowing that He loves us, He cares for us, and He ordains all things for our good. And so here's our central idea for this passage. We must live with confidence in God's power and goodness while not ignoring the ugly ugly realities of our fallen world and also while understanding that God is using all things to fulfill his purpose both for us, his people, and the universe he has created. Here in John chapter 16, Jesus speaks to his apostles. He prepares them for their suffering. The suffering of the apostles was to be one uh, that happened at the hands of religious uh, persecution, religious authorities, and governmental authorities. But to think that this passage does not speak to us in our suffering, in our uncertainty of the future, would be foolish. Of course, Jesus' words speak to us here today. And of course, It does now as ever because Jesus Christ remains the life and the center of the church. In him and through him, we have answers and meaning. In Jesus Christ, we find the author and the perfecter of our faith. And no matter what a specific Christian's experience may be, no matter what kind of suffering or trials may come our way, all suffering is an assault on and a threat to our faith. All trials, all sufferings, what do they do? They tempt us to doubt God's word. They tempt us to doubt God's promises. They tempt us to doubt God's salvation. Trials and afflictions 
times of, of great evil in the world, tempt us to trust in idols. They tempt us to trust in medicine, in economic bailouts, or in fleeting pleasures while life on earth continues. And just as all suffering from religious persecution to a viral pandemic is an assault on our faith, so so we must walk through these trials with Jesus' words on the front of our minds when he says, in this world you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. The first thing that we find as we consider this statement from Jesus as we understand that it has application uh, to all the sufferings of our life, not just religious persecution, but anything that would be an assault on or a threat to our faith, we see that having peace, a particular kind of peace, but having peace is an important aspect to our faith. Jesus says, I have said these, th- these things to you so that in me you will have peace. In other words, Jesus taught his disciples. Jesus teaches us as our great high prophet that, uh, so that we would have peace. John 14 verse 27 says this, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. Jesus came to give his people peace. We read at the end of Romans, the benediction that the Apostle Paul gives, says this, The God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. It's interesting, as as you look to the scriptures, so often when God is described as the God of peace, he is described in such a way because he is the one who is powerful enough to ultimately defeat all of our enemies. Why is God the God of peace? Because he will crush the one who stands against us. In other words, he is the God who makes peace. 2 Thessalonians 3, may the Lord of peace himself give you peace at all times in every way. So to have peace in God is to have confidence in his word and his power and his goodness. That's uh, ultimately what peace is. Confidence in God's word and his power and his goodness. Because the kind of peace that we experience in God, in Christ is different than any worldly conception of peace. It needs to be rooted and anchored in God and his word, in his salvation. It needs to be rooted in eternity. And indeed, it needs to be rooted in the eternal life that he gives to us. God's word tells us again and again and again that God is powerful and that he is good. If he were powerful without being good, then that would be very terrifying for us. If he were good without being powerful, then trusting him wouldn't be worth our time. But God is both powerful and he is good. And that is why we can trust him. Because he's powerful enough to hold the universe by the word of his power. And to have all things ordained by his decree. Everything that happens... In this world, indeed in this universe, was ordained by God and is under his sovereign control. But the Lord is also good. And because of that, what he calls his people to do is to trust him, to make him their rock and their refuge. To make him the refuge in the storm, the strong tower to which we would flee, our strength and our shield. Nahum 1.7, the Lord is good, a stronghold in the day of trouble. He knows those who take refuge in him. Psalm 28, verse 7, the Lord is my strength and my shield. In him my heart trusts and I am helped. My heart exults and with my song I give thanks to him. Psalm 37, the salvation of the righteous is from the Lord. He is their stronghold in times of trouble. The Lord helps them. And delivers them because they take refuge 
in him. What we are called to do is to experience the peace of God, the peace of God which surpasses all understanding as we come to know and to understand that he's in control and he is also good. He's in control and he is also good. We also have the assurance that God is with us and God's presence makes all the difference. Lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age, Jesus says. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will not fear any evil. Why? Because you are with me. So Jesus says, I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. But then he says, in this world you will have trouble. In this world you will have tribulation. So we know that there's tension between those two things. But when we understand the source of our peace and uh, the eternal realities which anchor our peace, that our anchor, the anchor of our peace is in heaven and that it's in our eternal life, then we begin to make some sense of the tension between these two things. Jesus says tribulation is going to, to come your way. As biblical Christians, we need not be surprised by the kinds of things that we're seeing in our world. Jesus said in Matthew 24... That basically in between the time that he ascends into heaven and when he comes again, there are going to be wars and rumors of wars and famines and plagues. Revelation chapter 6, most reformed commentators would say that uh, that's a chapter that describes the time in between Christ ascending into heaven and coming back. And in Revelation chapter 6, one of the riders on the, the horses, one of the horsemen, the, the pale horse, tells us that all of the world, indeed uh, uh, up to a quarter of the world at any time, is going to be marred by famine and plague. These things need not surprise us. Reminds me in uh, Lord of the Rings when someone tells Frodo, it's a dangerous business, Frodo, going outside your door. Anytime we leave uh, the comfort of our home, indeed, even within our own home, all kinds of ugly realities uh, we are met with as we see them. This is a world that is fallen, that is marred by sin and by death. And so we take Jesus at his word, and when things come into our lives, things like this situation this week with the coronavirus, does it surprise us? Well, no, no. Perhaps in many ways the world in which we live has created an illusion of control, that we are in control of our lives and we know exactly uh, how we're going to live and how we're going to die. We, we even see movements now of people deciding when they are going to die. And we know that those are things that we, we cannot take into our hands and God is the one who is in control. So when we are met with tribulation, we're not surprised. This is what it means to be a biblical Christian, that things like this aren't going to surprise us. We are also called to not be enslaved or conformed to the world's anxieties. We are called to be transformed by the renewing of our minds and have our minds renewed and transformed by the realities that God declares to us in his word. And so the Apostle Paul says in Philippians chapter 4, do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving let your requests be made known to God. In other words, don't be anxious, but pray. Don't be anxious, but pray. What is a, a major thing that we need to be doing here in the coming weeks? Well, many of us hunker down and stay inside as much as, as possible. What do we need to be doing? We need to be praying. We need to be praying. Today, Sunday, is a national day of prayer, declared so by our president. And we need not ask how genuine he was in his declaration. I believe it was a, a genuine thing, and we should respond with as much genuineness as we can possibly show. We should be fervent and excited to engage in long prayer today. And indeed every day. John Calvin said it's the chief exercise of our faith. It is a blessing from God where we commune with him. We ought to be praying because the Apostle Paul, one of the reasons we should be praying, the Apostle Paul says, don't be anxious, but pray. We combat our anxiety and our worry and our fear with prayer. 
And then what does Paul say? And then the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. The Lord says, you pray, you pray in faith. This peace comes to you as a gift. And that will guard your heart. It will guard your mind. Think of God sending two guards to stand watch over your heart and your mind. That's what he gives to his faithful saints when they engage in prayer. So we're not surprised by tribulation. We're not surprised by trial. But Jesus nevertheless gives us encouragement in the midst of it. Take heart, he says. Take heart. I have overcome the world. To take heart means to be comforted and emboldened to live in a way supernaturally affected by God's truth and promises in Christ. To be comforted and emboldened to live in a way supernaturally affected by God's truth and promises in Christ. That's at least part of what Jesus means when he says to take heart. Experience the comfort that he gives. Have a boldness which comes through being supernaturally affected by God's truth and promise. In other words, the Holy Spirit takes God's word and brings it down into the, the core of who we are. And transformation occurs as we take God's word into our hearts and hide it there and think on it. And God's spirit does its work in us. In order that we would take heart, we uh, need to use all that God has given to us. So not only do we use his word, but we use all of the faculties he has given to us to understand and to treasure his word. Our minds, our affections, which allow us to treasure him and his truth. And then our will, which allows us to live lives that are marked by God's work in us. So the mind, God's given us a mind. What are the things uh, that we know that help us take heart? How can we take heart as, uh, according to Jesus' instruction? What, how can we use our minds to help us take heart in these interesting times? Well, the first thing is that we know that God has made a world that we can understand. God has made a world of order and logic. He has created it in such a way that it can be understood and that we can understand it. So as time goes on, we will trust that we will learn more and more about this situation. Coronavirus, COVID-19, whatever you may call it. We will learn more and more. And as we do so, we ought to give thanks that God has not left us to just uh, wallow at, at the feet of this disease. There are going to be things that we can do. Indeed, even our not meeting together today is a result of our thinking that it was wise uh, to follow the instructions of many who say social distancing is really important now to try to slow the spread of the disease. We do that, and as we do that, we understand and we give glory to God that he has given us a mind to be able to understand these things. And that helps us take heart. That helps us to live in the comfort and the boldness that comes through God's truth. Each situation calls for us to learn and then adjust according to what we learn. Expecting a nuclear bomb like C.S. Lewis wrote about in the mid-20th century is not like the, the, the flu epidemic of 1918 and 1919, which actually claimed about 50 million people worldwide. And we, we thank the Lord that we're nowhere near that now and we pray that we, we, won't, we won't be. Even back then, in 1918 and 1919, we practiced pretty rigorous social distancing. I read up on some history of Christian Reformed churches in Michigan that weren't able to worship together for a time for that very reason that they were trying to keep uh, germs and the spread of the flu uh, at bay. So as we learn about all of these things, we need to uh, take wisdom to mind and ask uh, what are the kinds of ways that we can act and we can live in light of the things that we are learning. It's fascinating to read Martin Luther as uh, he lived through an outbreak of, of the Black Plague uh, in Europe and uh, he says this and I thought it was just a, a wonderful word 
for us to think about as, as we attempt to serve God and live for him in the midst of this current situation. He said this, Therefore, I shall ask God mercifully to protect us. Then I shall fumigate, help purify the air, administer medicine and take it. I shall avoid places and persons where my presence is not needed in order not to become contaminated and thus perchance infect and pollute others and so cause their death as a result of my negligence. If God should wish to take me, he will surely find me and I have done what he has expected of me and so I am not responsible for either my own death or the death of others. If my neighbor needs me, however, I shall not avoid place or person but will go freely as stated above. See, this is such a God-fearing faith because it is neither brash nor foolhardy and does not tempt God. God has given us a mind to be able to understand the situation and say, uh, what is prudent, what is wise, what is good to do here? Uh, We understand that God is sovereign and that he is in control, but he also calls us to live with the wisdom that he gives to us. And we, we should not tempt God. We should not be foolhardy or brash or do things that are very clearly unwise when he's given us a mind to know that we ought not do those things. Second way that we can take heart is by understanding and knowing that God is the architect of our lives. Jesus says, who by worrying can add a single span to his life? God has ordained the end from the beginning. He has every breath that you will ever take declared and ordained. You can't add one breath. You can't take one breath away. Ultimately, it is in God's sovereign will. It's all numbered. They're all numbered and they're all appointed. God is the architect of our lives. So knowing that allows us to live with a comfort, a confidence, and a boldness. Nothing can touch me until God's appointed time for me. And knowing that he is sovereign and he is good allows me to say that whenever God has willed that the end of my life should come, I will trust that it is good and it is right. For he is good and all that he does is right. Thirdly, we are to know that trials are a way that our faith is refined and we are made ready for the next world. God is on a mission to make our practice match up with our position. In the gospel of Jesus Christ, we have been made new. We are fully accepted in God. He looks upon us and we are righteous. All of our sins are washed away. But the ongoing work of God in us is so that our lives, so that our practice would match up more with our position. And the way that God does that, the way that God refines our faith, the way that God increases us in holiness and service to him is most often through trials, through difficulty. Think of all of the great heroes of the faith that you've learned about in your life. All those people who showed great courage, perseverance, faithfulness, uh, steadfastness. And all of those great stories of the martyrs of the faith or those who gave and who gave and who gave and who served under the most intense of circumstances. All of those virtues that we admire so much were shown to be present in times of great trial, not in times of great ease. And so when we pray to God asking him to strengthen our faith, he's going to strengthen our faith in the midst of circumstances. He's going to strengthen our faith in the midst of trial. He's not just going to to zap us and say, now your faith is stronger. And so then we can think about that and understand that in our sufferings, God is shaping us. He's shaping us. God is more concerned about your character than your earthly comfort. He's more concerned about your holiness than your happiness. God is doing something in you. And all of a sudden you realize, you understand as you are uh, met with times of great uncertainty, with with times of great trial, with times where people are being hit with uh, despair and disease. And all of a sudden you realize God is doing something in me 
through this situation. He's building me up. He's refining my faith. This may be a threat and an assault on my faith. But as I trust God... And as I see his work in me, I can actually take great joy so that the Apostle Paul can say, I rejoice in my sufferings because sufferings produce endurance. Endurance produces character and character produces hope. See, all of those things are wonderful things. And Paul's reasoning is, why would you not want those? Why would you not want endurance and character and hope? Why would you not want to know your Savior more as you suffer more following the way of your Savior, you come to know him more because you come more and more to realize that the suffering that he went through for you to make you his is, is unlike any suffering in the history of the world. He suffered as a truly righteous man, sinless, full of love, filled with the heart for his people. Psalm 138 says that God will fulfill his purpose for me. That's a wonderful promise for us to remember that wherever he brings us, wherever we go, God is fulfilling his purpose for us. And so uh, we then bring this to a, a final thing that we can know, and that's this, that it's just the great promise of comfort that nothing can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. Nothing can take God from us, his blessing from us. Nothing can take Christ from us. He is always with us and God's presence with us makes the ultimate difference. When we become sick and when we die, we haven't lost God's blessing. We haven't lost God's promises. Why? Because Christ has overcome the world. Take heart, Jesus says. Live in comfort and boldness. Why? Because I have overcome the world. He defeated death through death to show us that death no longer is to hold us in its grip. One person reflecting on this week's situation said this, the eyes of faith see the world for what it is. No virus, no stock market crash, no panicked media reactions can rob Christians of their hope that Jesus will give his victory and dominion over sin and death to all who believe in him. Live with that confidence in the coming weeks. Live with that confidence that nothing can separate you from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. My instinct over the past few days is to just soldier on and forge ahead and we'll hold church and we'll all get together. We get as many people in this sanctuary together and, and that will be great because we want to show that we have confidence. We decided that it would be unwise to do so because of what we talked about just a couple of minutes earlier. We need to learn. We need to understand what we can do uh, to help hold up life and not to put life in danger. But nevertheless, as many of us hunker down in the coming days and have less personal interaction with people, live in the confidence that when you're tempted to despair, when you're tempted to, to, to feel like this time is not going to pass, Live in the confidence that nothing will separate you from the love of God in Christ Jesus, our Lord. And as you see the goodness of God in all of that, that ought to make you treasure him more. It ought to make you love him more. And then as you think about how do I serve God in this unique time, well, think about how you were helpless, how you were trapped in a a miry bog of your sin. And think of a, someone who now is struggling on the, the, the precipice of life and death with uh, this coronavirus and this terrible suffering that's been brought on a lot of people. And they have no hope in and of themselves. And uh, they have no plea in and of themselves. But uh, there are many people who are working in, in hospitals and clinics in order to, to give those people the help that gives them a fighting chance. We think about our lives and what do we realize? God, God has done that for us in a much more magnificent way. He came to us when we were helpless. He came to us when we were hopeless. He lifted us up and he set our feet upon a rock. And so as the words of Luther we read a, a few minutes ago, when there is someone in need as you are given ability, 
and as you are given an opportunity to help, shouldn't you consider it a, a great privilege to offer a helping hand to someone in need as you are able? There's many of us who are of a particular age group that you should probably be the one receiving help and not seeking to help. But many of us still may be able to have a a giving heart and a generous heart to help those in need, to grab an extra uh, grab an extra bag of toilet paper in the grocery store and bring it by somebody's house who can't get to the store or any grocery, anything that they may need. A generous and a giving heart uh, because God has been so gracious and loving and giving for us. We're to be filled with compassion and mercy for others because God has shown his compassion and his mercy to us. And ultimately, we live abiding in Christ and walking by the Spirit and having joy in all of these things. We ought to be filled with confidence that in all things God will never leave us. Some of you may have seen me post this uh, earlier this week online, but I'll have this be the end. Uh, quote by Joseph Gilmore, the one who wrote, He leadeth me, which we were going to sing together had we met together today. He said this, It was the darkest hour of the Civil War, and it may subconsciously have led me to realize that God's leadership is the one significant fact of human, ex- of human experience, that it makes no difference how we are led or to where we are led, so long as we are sure that God is leading us. He is leading us. He's in control. He's in control as much now as he ever has been. He always will be in control. A virus spreads, but the Lord still reigns. He's still king, and he's still reigning and ruling on his throne. Live in awe of him. Love him even more each and every day, and always live seeking to glorify him. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks and praise and adoration. We ask that you will bless this, the proclamation of your word. Even in unique circumstances, we pray that your spirit would do its work in your people and that you would build us up for the days to come. May you be glorified in all things and may we we count it a great privilege to serve you and to serve our King, Jesus Christ. In his name we pray. Amen.